So let's call uh, increasing food prices um, and other types of issues uh, that are driven by this central banking uh, structural failure or or, uh, complexity. Uh, How is that affected in relationship to something like an external shock where we have with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, where it's very obvious that they're a large wheat producer, natural gas, et cetera. And people are saying, look, if fertilizer prices spike, if wheat can't get out of the region, uh, there is the potential for uh, much higher prices in a good situation and a bad situation, literally famine in some parts of the world. Um, And so if the long kind of macro structure or trend is the central bank is going to cause these issues because uh, they just can't get out of their way, and then you have an external shock that also is going to drive food prices higher, like do those two things converge and just magnify the problem or are they two separate situations? they're exactly the same situation. In in fact, there's monetary policy – and this is probably deeper than we can explore on the show, but um, but monetary policy is the rise of the war in, in Ukraine as well. Because effectively what you have is U.S. being able to get free energy in oil by pressing a button and, and Russia selling their oil or their, their value and their labor mm-hmm. in stuff that it gets devalued. Mm-hmm. And so that and, and so as you do that and there's one country that has a monetary standard of the world and can keep on getting an advantage in trade and, and energy prices is der- derivative of everything else and you have an advantage in trade other people have a disadvantage. And so their economies suffer as a result of the uh, uh, of that uh, uh, advantage and disadvantage. So what China did in in 2015 with the same thing, they realized that that the U.S. couldn't pay its bills anymore. So for a long time, China was a beneficiary of this trade. They kept labor rates high, uh, low, and if 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 the economy didn't function really well in the United, the United States, in other words, if interest rates went up. U.S. economy would have collapsed Mm -hmm. and therefore all of the buying from China would have collapsed too and their economy would have collapsed. So it was a, it was a beneficial relationship, but, but China pegged their dollar, their yuan to the, to the U.S. dollar. Um, and you had the low labor rates, high labor rates, Mm -hmm. and that balance all over the world has to equal zero. So when, and, and to keep interest rates low, China bought U.S. bonds. Correct. But when they stopped buying U.S. bonds in 2015 and realized U.S. can't pay the, back their debts and, and they're not going to pay back their debts. So they took the money and they kept the peg. They took the, took the money and ha- as they're hollowing out the, 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 uh, the U.S. economy um, and put it into safe haven assets, rare earth minerals, real estate all over the world, they're kind of expanding their their footprint all over the world with that same trade balance Mm -hmm. um, instead of putting it into U.S. dollars. So what did U.S. dollar have to do to stop a depression at that time? They had to monetize their own debt. Mm -hmm. And they had to actually take their, essentially take their citizens' money um, and make the rich richer and the poor poorer by monetizing uh, uh, their debt, and that that creates this geopolitical rival um, that is getting stronger and stronger and stronger because of that same uh, uh, imbalance. And so, as everybody's pegging their, everybody's trying to find their way to what is what is valuable. And what Russia just did is said, "You can print your money all you want. Um, my oil is more valuable than your printed dollars." Mm-hmm. And we're gonna we're gonna price it in something else. We're gonna start pricing it in something else. Now, if they, a lot of people are worried, okay, they're gonna price it in yuan, or they're. And I suspect if you just do the game theory on this, China isn't gonna be the reserve currency of the world. Mm-hmm. Like, who would trust that to happen in another country having a reserve currency in the world, including China? Would they want that? Because then they would have to run the structural imbalance that U.S. is running. Mm-hmm. Um, and you would port, U.S. labor rates would fall a lot, China labor rates would rise, and industry would move back. Uh, back, uh, back. And so, so that balance all over the world has. And, and, um, 
And so what, what you need um, is a neutral reserve asset that as countries do, uh, do um, trade with one another and labor moves up or they have a strong industry, labor moves up and it, it rebalances automatically. And so we don't have that today. Um, and, and all countries are trying to essentially look inwards and create policies that don't realize that we live in an interconnected world mm-hmm. for their own good. And, they're, and, and it's, it's driving massive chaos, supply chains, chaos that is bound to get a lot worse. Like they, we are, we're, we're a long way from done on this. So what you can expect in the macroeconomic landscape is if you look back 20 years and we think, oh, we live in a really safe world, everything's every everything's great. And it seems like these iterations are getting worse and, we're, and it's hard to believe. And we're, we're sucked into the news media over and over and over in these events. Every one of them is connected and they're getting bigger and bigger oscillations. And I find myself, you want to react to the events, but if you look at the structure and what has to happen they're gonna get worse i wish i didn't have to say that but they're gonna get a lot worse hey you did you like this video great we make five of them a day and post them here on this channel make sure you subscribe like the video and see you next time